Well, let's just do a quick thing and then. Yeah, I was just by that anyway, weren't? Yeah, it was really nice. So they did they did do quite an annoying thing where you were you had to book to use the spa, but just to go into the actual spa bit. So like when you're at the spa for a weekend, you don't really know what you're going to be doing. Yeah, the idea is just to do whatever you feel like doing, isn't it? Yeah, so we went to use it like yesterday evening and they were like, oh, sorry, you can't come in. There's too many people here. And they're like, how many people are there? They're like, you're only allowed 10 in at a time. Yeah. And you're like, well, the restaurant has got about 30 people in it. Yeah. That's a bit annoying. But other than that, it's well nice. Me, um, me and Vicky went to, um, we booked a Bannantine spa day in Leicester yeah. a couple of years ago now. And it cost us like what, probably about a hundred quid, yeah, which isn't cheap. Yeah. Um, for like it's just a, effectively you're there for as long as you want to be there for just one day. So we yeah. drove down there, and we thought a spa day was going to be like like you had, but it was just the gym swimming pool. Right. So we got there at like eleven o'clock in the morning. Our massage wasn't till like half four. So we're thinking, you know, like yeah, jacuzzi yeah. pool, then go yeah. chill out in like outside somewhere, whatever we sat by the pool for about five minutes and I was like, this is shit. Like the pool's tiny. Like it wasn't even the same photos. Really? That's really Oh bad yeah, bad. Vicky just shouted, the jacuzzi was broke. So you had like a tiny little sauna and then just a, like two lane swimming pool. And then you had to be there for like five hours just to get a shitty half hour massage. And I was like, no. So we complained and they gave us all our money back. And we yeah. Right, let's do the update then. So I can't remember what we spoke to Brian about. It was like anything and everything, weren't it? Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another podcast. Don't know what episode it is. What episode are we on? Episode 18. 18. And this one is a special one. It's with our ambassador. And it, well, it's a two-parter because it's so long. Um, and it's with Bray Hunziker, who is a front ambassador. And we're really, really excited because he's definitely big in the game he's well respected is that fair to say isn't it i don't know I, 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 i've got a man crush on him because I've, I've followed him for like a good couple of years so yeah you know yeah. and he's one of the reasons why we kind of started front for, for my side i guess because i went to buy one of his prints yeah of and, course. yeah yeah so which i think he sells too cheap but um mm. yeah he, he sells prints for like 25 30 dollars or whatever it was but after all the import tax and mm. shipping, it was coming in at like $70, $80. So I messaged him. I was like, look, if we can do something like this in the UK. Would you be interested? He was like, yeah, hell yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah super, That's super great. nice guy. Really interesting to talk to. Um, but yeah, you, you, you tell the people what we're talking about. What, what are you just saying? Well, I've only, I've only edited about 10% of it so far. I've been through it. So uh, we talk about how we got started in photography and a couple of things about the kit he uses he's talking about the importance of like creating really good quality videos so obviously he's got his youtube channel um and the, the videography being as important as the photography um and then i don't know what else we talked about because we recorded we it about in about two months ago i reckon longer than that i reckon three or four months ago okay but whenever it was, we, it was a, you know, we recorded it long, quite a long time ago, but we were kind of saving it. Oh, is that what it was? End of April, yeah. Okay, yeah, so a good couple of months ago. Um, but yeah, kind of a little bit starstruck when we was talking to him. I don't know, if you've been living under a rock for the last couple of years and you don't know who he is, then obviously go check out his website. He's doing really, really positive things for the community as well. Uh, I'm sure we talk about his community fund in this in this podcast episode. Um, yeah, I think we do. Yeah, go go check out his website, check out his Instagram, and if you're not, go follow his YouTube because his videos are mind blowing. Because it's more than just the photography, isn't it? Like you were saying. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, he's a very inspiring person to talk to, to listen to. It was a good. It was a good chat, wasn't it? Yeah, it was good. It was good. But yeah, we won't ramble on for too long because. Yeah, it's quite a long one, but it's worth it. It's worth listening to. Um, enjoy. Ooh. Drum roll, please. I feel like that's my thing to do now. Yeah, 
basically picked up a camera for the first time when I was around nine or 10 years old because my dad, he was a photography teacher for a long time. And he also was just into photography uh, as a hobby and stuff. And he was taking photos ever since he was, you know, in his 20s. And he was always pretty in tuned with the photography scene. And so when I was old enough to perform basic human functions, he, you know, kind of would allow me to go off with him if he was going out to shoot for a day or something. And he had an extra camera and he just kind of, you know, let me run around and play around with it. And yeah, I didn't, you know, I was, I was really, really young at that point too young to really I think you know fall in love with it but it definitely interested me to be able to go out and take a picture of something and then you know he'd go pull it up on the computer and take a look at it afterwards it was pretty cool and then um did that uh, like every once in a while up until freshman year of high school and then um I got really drawn into the whole video side of things when GoPro uh, really started to take off. Um, I was getting into action sports and snowboarding and stuff like that. And so when I saw GoPro release the, the GoPro hero camera and saw everything that was going on in that kind of sphere, I was really intrigued by it. And then I got the, I got like a GoPro camera, the first GoPro that ever came out when I was a freshman in high school and just started filming my friends and I all of our shenanigans and uh when we'd go up to the mountain and go snowboarding and stuff take the GoPro with me and just make these fun little edits and videos and that was what really um like got me hooked uh was getting into uh just recording my daily activities that I'd do with my friends. And I just would sit at my computer and watch tutorials on how to edit and all this stuff for hours and hours and hours on end. And during the summers, I just run around with the GoPro, get a bunch of footage during the day, come back and edit it all at night. And then I just got super addicted to it. And yeah, that lasted like years all the way through high school. I was just always filming with my friends and we were always just recording everything we were doing. And then in college, I got really into the whole like vlogging thing and everything Casey Neistat was doing. And I was like super inspired by all that stuff. So then I thought I was going to be a daily vlogger and I tried doing that for a bit. And uh, yeah, so I've like, I was just really all, all invested into video the video side of things um and i grew my skill set in the video realm over those years from freshman year of high school up until about two years ago and then um yeah i i kind of went through a mental metamorphosis i'd say and and didn't exactly uh see myself moving forward with the type of video work that i was doing at the time and right at the same time my dad gifted me my first film camera, the uh, Bronica SQ, and I didn't even know anything about film at the time at all. Like, I mean, I knew that I knew what the format generally was, but I didn't know anything about film cameras, motion picture film cameras. You know, when I watched movies, I didn't ever take the time to look at the the shots and, and do any background research and see if like what stuff is still being shot on film and what's being shot on digital like all that was just foreign to me and then he gifted me this film camera and I just when I when I get introduced to a new hobby I just dive like full force into it and uh, so I just spent you know hours and hours watching videos on YouTube about film photography and got super hooked like I've never been hooked before and then it just spiraled out of control after that and now it's now it's come full circle back to now my interest is like really in still photography again um, because my dad just randomly was visiting me in college and there's an old camera store and he stopped by and he was like yo I just randomly bought this camera I think you should 
give it a try. And it's some, it's a camera that I always wanted when I was your age, the Bronica SQ. And I was like, what the heck? This thing is sick. And then just, yeah, like started taking pictures all the time on it and made myself go broke taking pictures on it because I was just, I already got so hooked. And um, yeah, so that ended up made things come kind of full circle. And now I've found a way to kind of fuse my love because I still love video, obviously. So I found a way to fuse my interest in video with my interest in film photography by making the the YouTube videos. And that has put me at, uh, at the present day. So, yeah. 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 Well, we, me and Luke actually talked about this because I guess we just assumed you went to film school and studied yeah. 25 years because it's that yeah. good. You know what I mean? <laughs> Thank you. Time. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah, it just all YouTube stuff. Um, yeah, it's yeah. People talk about whether or not it's worth it to go to film school, and it's like to learn the actual technical side of like filmmaking. I'd say not at all. But as far as the connections that you can probably make in film school, if you're looking to like go into the industry, into the actual like film industry, and you want to like work in Hollywood, then it seems like film school is pretty necessary, just because a lot of those schools work directly with the um, the studios and stuff, so they have the connections to put you in play with a lot of these people that can maybe get you a career in that field. But as far as learning, like you know the general technical side of filmmaking and even photography it's and if you're gonna be spending you know in in the u.s like 50k a year potentially to go to film school and you're just interested in learning like how to use a camera and how to make some cool videos (laughs) i would strongly reconsider because that can all be learned on youtube for free so yeah um but i spent a lot of my time like just hours and hours on YouTube watching tutorials and, and learning how to do different things and finding my own kind of style. But it's been a fun process. I, I did the same. So I got really into video. Like I actually studied video at college, mm-hmm. like your version of school, I want to say, like later school, because we have college, yeah. university, you have high school. Oh, okay. Yeah, we have high school and then college. Yeah. yeah so like, mine is your equivalent of high school and i studied film there and then a year later i picked up photography Mm -hmm. with photography and doing film yeah i wasn't learning what i wanted to do i I just wanted to go out and film make some cool edits yeah you know no one appreciates your work more than you do how many hours right computer yeah i know i've said this before but i was the same with gopro i got a gopro hero three i think that was like I know mm-hmm. GoPro is still relatively new sort of thing, only been out a couple of years. Yeah. And I, I remember finding that about GoPro. It was um, made by like a, like the owner at the time or when it started. He was just like a surfer, wasn't he? He was just like... Uh, yeah. Yeah. He wanted to film himself surfing and there wasn't yep. out there, which I think yeah. I think it works really well with all action sports, like you said. Um, but yeah, that's. But I, I, I had no idea that you just self-taught yourself through YouTube yeah yeah it's been a fun process and it's still there's so i mean i still find things every day that i'm like wow i didn't know that or you know it, it, there's just a the that ceiling is four hours of editing earlier yeah <laughs> yeah the ceiling's just always unattainable but that's what makes it fun because there's always stuff to learn and there's always i'll be out filming a video and i'll find something new that i can do from a filmmaking standpoint and it gets me excited again you know oh this is this is gonna be a fun experiment to try and whatnot but yeah you know what, what, what do you use this what camera do you use now to record your video a panasonic gh5s okay nice. so a little mirrorless micro four thirds um yeah. yeah the thing is super solid wow. for the price point i think it's it's hard to beat but yeah, yeah I've, all, I've i've used the g the panasonic cameras for a while the gh4 and then upgraded the gh5s so been pretty happy with with that camera and it's lightweight enough i can take it on my travels and hikes and stuff so yeah yeah really content with that that guy yeah yeah that was my first little mirrorless camera was like a gx 80 or something like that oh yeah like really decent um, yeah really cool little like so much stuff you can play around with on them that i would never have guessed you were filming your stuff on a micro four thirds that's awesome yeah 
yeah it's they're, they're underrated man and the, the low light too is crazy mm -hmm. super nice the dual native iso um for micro thir four thirds is pretty impressive so but i've been eyeing the black magic pocket cinema camera to be honest <laughs> wow yeah, yeah. but the, i picked one up in the store and for the first time like two weeks ago and i was blown away by how big they are i didn't know that uh, they were that chunky yeah yeah they're I thick think... cameras they look like they'd be quite small when you look at them online. and the name pocket cinema camera i was like oh sick you know it's going to be the size of a mirrorless camera and then i <laughs> saw it and i was like oh sweet jesus that is a cinema camera wow. so but um yeah i've i'm toying around with getting one eventually um just to have a nice hybrid when i'm out hiking and traveling and stuff i can use the panasonic and then you know if i'm uh, doing some more controllable environment stuff then i can maybe use the the pocket cinema camera but yeah i always try to take steps to ensure that my video is up to the standards that i have because i i do kind of have just as much of a respect and admiration for high quality filmmaking and video as i do for the photos like they go hand in hand mm -hmm. very much so um so yeah it's not solely about like film photography for me even though that's the backbone there's a lot of things that i really like to focus on outside of just the images themselves and that's you know quality video and the experiences that i have when i go out and film the videos the people that i bring along from time to time and i don't know if that's maybe just because we have a certain eye for it or we or maybe we're looking out for it more but i think the quality of your videos are superior to a lot of people because you know you get a lot of channels that just kind of you know they'll do a quick intro they'll throw up 36 photos they'll put some mm -hmm. you know you know whatever it is free to you sample music over the top and that's it yeah Which, fair enough you know if, you, if you're not trying to promote yourself as a videographer if it's yeah. purely about the photos then fine yeah but I, I look forward to watching yours because i know it's going to be like a cinematic experience do you know what i mean like yeah, yeah i want it to feel that way for sure yeah, appreciate that definitely comes across like that. and then and then i'm always blown away you know from where you are and stuff especially on the hikes and stuff uh -huh. but you know we just don't have that here. <laughs> yeah super fortunate to be in in washington where it's it's just right in your backyard you know you got these these landscapes and views that are pretty spectacular um and it wasn't really until i started getting into film photography that I be, that I grew an even deeper interest in exploring a lot of the places that we have here in Washington. Um, I've been an outdoors, I've been interested in the outdoors for a long time, but it's always been just kind of the first thing that pops up on Google and I'll run out there with my friends and, you know, not take it seriously. Um, but after I started getting back into still photography and specifically film photography, I love joining those uh, interests of mine into one experience the the outdoors enthusiast inside me and the film photographer inside me um, they lend themselves really nicely or they lend themselves together really nicely yeah. and it's so fun to be able to go out and experience nature in a beautiful location and then also have a camera with me I can document the experience not only for myself but for others to relive at a future date it's i've just i've found a lot of um satisfaction in that whole process but i can tell that you have the eye for it because there's a quite a few of your videos I, i've watched your channel for a couple of years right so i've, I've kind mm -hmm. of used to you know i can see the changes that you've yeah and then also like i look forward to the locations that you're going on but then uh -huh. the videos that you don't necessarily start at the location that you plan to go so yeah. you'll be driving somewhere and then before the videos even got going you've stopped three times in your car pulled off yeah. the oh, yeah. and you've taken photos yeah. because you've seen something cool and the, the photographer the videographer in you wants to stop and capture that moment which i yeah. think is cool because a lot of people won't do that they'll just go oh i'm i'm here today here's my video, but you've documented it in a way where you're like, Oh, that looks yeah. sick. I've got to stop and take a photo. Yeah. Yeah. My, my mantra is just keep the camera rolling, you know, and, and you can cut it, you can cut it all after whatever you don't want. But like, I, 
it almost drives me insane sometimes because I'm so adamant on capturing any moment that I think might turn into a fun experience for somebody watching. So when I'm out there and I'm shooting, it's just constantly, I, I, I can't, I can't even take my mind off of the fact that I want to be capturing everything. So it's, a, it's about finding a nice balance between being able to go out and actually enjoy the experience for myself and also being able to document it, to turn it into a video and, and, a, and a series of images afterwards. Cause a lot of the times I'll go out and I'll start filming and then it's just, I'm just constantly, uh, I, I get constant, I have like foam fear of missing out FOMO about shots, about video clips, you know, and, it, and I see something that I want to film, but I, maybe I can't get there. I can't drive there. And then that just, that just eats away in the back of my head the rest of the day. So it's about just kind of chilling out, enjoying the clips that I'm able to get, you know, not taking it too seriously. Um, so that's, <laughs> uh, that's a, uh, the balance that I'm searching for right now, but overall it's, it's always just a super fun experience and, and, um, it's also good motivation to just get outside, you know, otherwise I'd, I'd be inside a lot more than I should be. It's always majestic when I see you sitting somewhere with a picturesque photo in front of you, eating your sandwich on your little lunch break. Oh, the sandwich. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. You can't beat it. The sandwich overlooking the lakes. Yeah. It's the, uh, tradition. What, one of the questions that we actually had for you was, but you've kind of already answered it a little bit, was tips for video makers because you, mm -hmm. like, again, before we spoke to you, we wasn't too sure on your background in terms of how you got as experienced as you are. But yeah. uh, I'm guessing you're just going to advise, watch as many YouTube videos as you can. Yeah, for the technical side of things, it's definitely just about getting getting on YouTube, watching tutorials, watching editing tutorials, learning how the camera works. Um, there's a lot of people that always preach that, you know, gear doesn't matter and you can overexpose, underexpose all these shots. It doesn't matter. Um, and to an extent that is true, but you have to have one hell of a personality to compensate for that. And when, and it also depends on the actual content that you're producing since you know, we are artists and, and photographers and filmmakers. We have an eye for that stuff. So when you go out and you make a video about film photography and the video itself is, you know, super shitty quality or conveys the idea that you have no idea what you're doing, which is completely fine because everyone is at that stage at some point. But it's really hard to captivate an audience that is so in tune with what a high quality image looks like and has the photographic eye right so i could i you know i can throw these videos out to friends and family who have no idea about who have no interest in photography and stuff and and uh yeah they won't you know think twice about it but to everybody that watches the videos that knows a thing or two about photography which that's the community that's the audience that i have is photographers and videographers you know it's it's really hard to get away with uh <laughs> with doing anything less than my best, I'd say, um, at least at first. So um, the, uh, the tough thing is, you know, getting to a point where you can start to not slack off, but um, get to a point where you can, you know, d d diminish some of the quality in your video if, if needed to help personality shine through a little bit right there's different elements and pillars that make up a high quality video and so it's at first um if you're if you're new to the the scene and you're trying to get noticed um it's really difficult i'd say to just come full force with solely your personality um i think it takes a good amount of of fusion between you know uh, being an exuberant outgoing person and also having the visuals to coincide with that. Um, you know, especially when you have so many people making such high quality videos these days, it's, uh, it's a almost becoming a saturated niche already. 
it's uh, it takes a lot to be able to fully stand out uh, to the point where people are going to take the time to watch not only one video, but two of your videos and three of your videos. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's at first about cutting all the fat off of your, your videos, you know, like I have some people that'll send me some of their videos that they're working on and, and, um, just ask me for recommendations of how to make it better. And a lot of the videos will be like, um, you know, 15, 16 minutes long. And my, my first, th the first thing that I say is, is if you like have, have one of your best friends watch this video or try to try to watch the video from a perspective of some somebody anybody else other than yourself which parts in the video are you just not going to care about because everybody has a personal bias when they're making a video about themselves I'm super guilty of this because I'll I'll film something and then I'll go back and watch it later and I'm like why is anybody ever going to care about this yeah you know this is a two minute section in the video that only I care about because I'm biased towards myself and I like watching my personality play back later on the screen so um, bit of an extended answer here, but yeah, just try to cut all the fat off of your videos, you know, make it as dense as possible. That's, that's my number one recommendation, you know, throw your personality in there, throw humor in there. Also humor just wins all the time. Humor is the key. Like you look at like Jason from grainy days, the dude is fucking hilarious. Oh, I would you know, to watch him do stuff. Exactly. Uh, it's like, if you, like, if I had to pay, if I had to pay five bucks a month to watch his videos i would absolutely do it you know and it's like if you can if you can get to a point where people are willing you know you and i are say yeah i'd pay five bucks a month in order to watch the content that, then you know you're doing something right and like humor is such a strong pillar in his videos and yeah like that humor wins 99 percent of the time so if you can find a way to be humorous outgoing is exuberant not an asshole and combine that with you know some decent, decent visuals, some fun filmmaking work, some good images, um, and then put that all together into the densest possible package you, you possibly can at first. You know, when you're first starting out, it's important to make those videos super dense. And then once you start to attract that kind of, you know, 10, 10 people that are commenting every video, 15 people that are commenting every video, then there's more leverage and more room to, you know, have it not be as dense and you can kind of stretch it out and do these separate sections where, you know, more of your personality is kind of coming through and there's, you know, like the, the whole like Ricky Pilsner skits that I do and stuff like at first I probably wouldn't have, I wouldn't do those like right off the bat, but like after I gained a little bit of a following and a little bit of a community that felt, you know, I felt comfortable with and I was like, okay, let's just throw this in there and see. And then you start to build these kind of personal experiences with the, with the audience. So yeah, it's, it's just about easing into it. Obviously if it goes well, then you know to keep it. And if not, you can just, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it's all, it's trial and error too. Like you just gotta be observant and see what works, what doesn't. And, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I've learned that just making things dense, densely packed is important. You know, yeah. don't, exactly. don't extend things longer than they need to be. I can't remember who said it, but there's a phrase like kill your darlings, I think is the phrase. When okay. To like kind of creating anything is like you've got to take all that stuff that you think is amazing and just like kill most of it. And then you'll be really left. Yeah. Because, yeah, you're so biased yep. towards your own work. I mean, that was a super in-depth answer, but that, that's good because we're, we're kind of battling at the moment because obviously, you know, we've started front or we're building front. Um, mm hmm in the podcast so we've got like the youtube channel and then we're kind of playing on the idea at the moment of doing a couple of photo walks and documenting it that kind of thing mm -hmm. but i think we're both scared to talk to the camera and oh, yeah we've made a big point about being funny and, and we're not fucking funny <laughs> I, don't <know. laughs> I don't know you guys seem pretty damn funny and the thing is is there's always a way to uh to use that to your advantage like you know i think people that uh that say uh I'm scared to talk to the camera or that it, that it, when they do film something it, it it is very apparent that they are uncomfortable in front of the camera don't try to hide that just embrace it you know that's what makes shit funny like that's gonna <laughs> that's gonna be something that everybody's gonna be able to laugh at all together when you're when you're awkward and sh and shy in front of the camera and and you try to hide it and conceal it that's when it actually becomes 
awkward and a little bit uncomfortable to watch but when you're when you're shy and and awkward in front of the camera and you embrace it and you joke about it yourself and and you can just make that relationship with the audience then it's like oh this is just a comfortable and funny place to be and like it also makes the audience feel you know because i I mean that's just how most people are even even i am like i I mean i'll do like 30 takes sometimes just for my intros because i'm like oh my god this just sounds stupid or i don't like the way this is going or i just sound uncomfortable in this so it's like i need you know it's just about you just yeah it's loosening up and and i always get so tense sometimes when i whenever i turn the camera on so i'm i'm i still battle with it but yeah just man you can't take things too seriously or else you just suck all the fun out of it yeah Yeah. we we did talk about it briefly like i don't think we ever can actually considered it but we were like should we do it like oh my god hey guys it's us we're Go yeah. on YouTube, subscribe to my channel, but we're, we're just not like that as people. Yeah, so yeah. We do that, do you know what I mean? Right, yeah. You don't want to be, uh, you don't want to be synthetic and like, yeah. and anything other than, and you, other than yourself, so. Um, yeah, and I yeah. kind of like, when we did the first one, we were just like, um, so I guess we're recording. Well, you know, <laughs> and it kind of worked, yeah. Yeah. Like, people seem to enjoy it but I, th- I think because we can take the piss out of ourselves that helps because we can't really get offended so then <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah exactly Easier. yeah uh, yeah but yeah, but yeah I, I think it's just it's, it's just a confidence thing the more you do it the better you'll get it yeah and it's i mean there's no there's no one that that just uploads the first video ever and it's and it's a picture perfect path to success you know it's like I've been uploading videos to YouTube since 2014 and I've uploaded like so many random things. Like at first it was just my random little action sports edits that I'd put up. And then it was literally like me just straight up copying Casey Neistat's vlog format and doing that for like, you know, a while. And then, uh, and then I copied like you Olson's vlog format and did that for a little while and that, you know, nothing gained traction there. And then, uh, I upload, I like even got super into like video games one time and I uploaded a, like I went through a video game phase and I uploaded like a, a video game related video for, uh, for Nick Merckx, the streamer on Twitch and like uploaded a video for like his stream on my YouTube channel, which is just like completely out of character and has no business being on my YouTube channel, but I uploaded that there. And so it's like, I've been, I've uploaded so much random stuff to my YouTube channel and it's, and that's since 2000, like. 13 or something that I've been uploading and so that's you know eight years of just uploading trying to find my space trying to find where I actually feel comfortable operating in and it yeah eight years later I finally kind of found a niche that ended up working for me that was film photography and I'm really grateful that it was film that it ended up being film photography because I can't really see myself doing any of the other videos that I was doing previously uh for a long period of time but film photography i'm still as interested in it interested in it as ever and i have a lot to look forward to when it comes to film photography so i'm just thankful that i have a space like youtube to um you know continue to share those experiences in the future but yeah there's no i mean there's just no way to just upload something and then boom you've you've found your style you've found your niche and and it's you know uh and then it's just success afterwards i mean it takes trial and error and time and 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 learning from your mistakes so even when you found some things you're always gonna yeah 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 even my even my film photography videos have been very different like if you go back and watch the ones i was making a year ago um they're very different from the style that I do now. And that's just because I, you know, I popped on and I, I was watching a lot of uh, like negative feedback, George's videos. And I was watching, of course, Willem's videos. And after I was watching Willem's for a while, he like watching his videos definitely gave me the motivation to just say, Hey, I'm going to go out and film a little film photography video. Why not? Yeah. So yeah, I definitely owe like Willem a lot of credit because watching his channel grow was hugely inspiring and motivating to me and um yeah and then actually the first guy that i started like following yeah and watching on a regular basis same it's really (laughs) random because 
because I actually found him for a skateboarder called John Hill. Um, oh, yeah. And they like did a collab on a video and then uh-huh. oh that that are photographers that have youtube videos because you, you know when you like you know there must be something but you don't know what to search for yeah i was at that stage it just so happened i was watching yeah what, like, i skateboard so i was like oh this is on there and then i found the willem and then that yeah. just rolled and then before you know it you, you're following you know yeah everyone that's around now which yeah is cool but there was it's one really video. cool there was one video that I, me and Luke were actually talking about it earlier. And it was, I think it was when, like, last year, maybe six months ago, you bought out five months ago. And it was the, the most important photographs video. Mm. And that mm-hmm. was a game changer. I felt like that was a, a little bit of a turning point on your channel because it kind of went from your videos that you were making every week, going on hikes, which were all wicked. And you, mm-hmm. only, you know, you wanted to kind of develop yourself. But then you bought yeah. that out. And I know that was kind of like older photos and older footage, but mm-hmm. I like the passion from that came back in that video. And it was, it's, a, it's an amazing video to watch. Yeah, it's emotional. Thank you. Photos and it clearly means something to you, which mm-hmm. portrays in that video as well. Yeah, it was uh, interesting making that video because those pictures, when I made the video, those pictures were taken about a year and a half prior. And one thing that I've noticed with photography uh, over the past, year or so is that I get heavily impacted by pictures from the past way more than I do pictures that I've taken recently. So I was going back and I was looking through those pictures from that trip just randomly, you know, about a year and a half later. And I was just really struck by them in a way that I hadn't been previously. And that's been the case for a lot of pictures that I've taken particularly film pictures I, I go back and even look at some of the first ever film pictures that I that I took and I'm just I you know to give myself some credit I just am really proud of the pictures that I you know were that I was able to take um, at certain points in my in, in starting film photography and not because they're fantastic pictures but just because I wanted to or had the courage to kind of you know try try something different or experiment with certain things and yes there's there's a you know a couple pictures that I've taken over the the past couple of years that I go back and I, I look back on every now and then and I'm I'm just always like damn how was I not more excited about this when I got the scans back like this is a really cool picture you know and um, those pictures from that trip those hit me really hard when I went back and I looked at them last fall and just because not only well more so than the fact that they're cool pictures aesthetically which a lot of them aren't super aesthetically pleasing pictures but just the subject and the story behind them I really felt that for the I felt it in a different way than I had before and yeah just kind of sparked and some inspiration to make that video explaining why I felt the way that I did when I viewed those pictures. And I also wanted to kind of show that you don't have to go out and make beautiful pictures all the time. You know, it's not a, as a landscape photographer. Well, I don't even, I I guess I'm, you know, yeah, I take a lot of landscape pictures as somebody who takes a lot of landscape images it's all it's a lot of the time very much about just going out and trying to make things look as beautiful as possible um but some of the most impactful pictures and the most important pictures aren't the ones that are super beautiful but rather have the character and backstory and grit um, such as the ones that i took on that trip so hopefully it's some it's uh maybe you know a little it can provide some perspective for other people that don't you know that maybe don't feel like they're going out and taking beautiful work all the time because a year or two you know one two three five ten years from now you might look back and and really think oh my gosh like I you know I was photographing some really important stuff and I didn't take the time to appreciate that so yeah let let your photographer like be very patient with photography is what i'm trying to say it's 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 something that can manifest in beautiful ways if you're patient enough so 
Mm. Hopefully that's the uh, message I can get across with the, with that video. Yeah, for sure. And I think mm. like, like me and Luca spoke about it a lot, like looking back at old work and appreciating it more than ever before. Yeah, like, yeah, it's crazy. Like, you look at so many photos, especially if you're getting film developed and stuff, or even if you speak digital and you're looking through all the photos you're taking and you don't, you're kind of flicking through them because you want to see them all when really mm -hmm. you sit and study it, especially if a time period's gone by and you've kind of forgotten about what you shot. Yeah. Like, I feel like some of that with my work and um, like Luke you, we were looking through yours the other day to put some photos up on the website and you were like yeah they're alright and I was like these are these are amazing mate like you, we should yeah. get them like yeah and I could even know they were a couple of years old yeah yeah yep. I think it took me about two and a half hours to go through and put out what was their 10 images yeah and I know I watched a film well, well I had a film on whilst I was doing it so I know it was about that long and everything, when I saw you the next day, I was like, these are all shit. Like, <laughs> we're not going to want it. We're not going to use any of these. And then showing you and you're like, they're all, yeah, they're, they're not. Yeah, you're like, them, yeah. yeah, I see it like stuff. Um, I do a, a lot of, I'll like take far too many pictures when I'm shooting digital. I did this the other day, fill up my memory card. And I was like, Oh, I've got to run out and I need to take my camera. I was filming something and I just wanted to take my camera as a backup. So I just emptied my memory card onto a hard drive and I know that I'll just forget about it now and I'll look back on those pictures in a few months and go, okay, there's a lot of stuff I've got to go through and delete, but you kind of, you see them in a totally different light. Mm -hmm. And it's nice having that. That's why I really like shooting on film. You've got that kind of waiting period anyway. Yeah. yeah for sure um i've said it before on this like the first roll of film i shot they're some of my favorite like, i've got them framed they're some of my favorite photos that i've taken yeah um, but yeah it would be nice to have that kind of a, a slightly more structured approach to getting that delay and looking at them when shooting on digital as well um, yeah there's a photographer i think his name's ollie kellett um i'll I'll find him and I'll put a link in the description if that's not his yeah. name. But he doesn't look at his photos until a year after he's taken them on the Oh, yeah. I remember you telling me about this, dude. Yeah, yeah. That's insane. I really like that um, that idea. And it's one of the reasons I kind of want to upgrade my Fuji to the X-Pro 3 because you've, it's, you've got the back covered up on there. Mm -hmm. and you're totally not like you know tempted to look at yeah constantly i know you could just like put a bit of tape on it or something but it's not the same thing yeah um, for sure i don't yeah I don't, so that's don't super it. cool i love that idea yeah yeah i did see i read this article the other day that somebody was like the next you know fuji is the kind of company that would do it but you could you should be able to set a thing on your camera where you can take 36 shots and they're locked for two days yeah and you just go out on a little trip. And I'm like, I love that. I really That'd be want that. awesome. Like, I know that you could, again, you could just do it, but you're going to forget how many shots you've taken or you're yeah. going to sort of just firing off a few or whatever it is. Like, yeah. It'd make you think more, wouldn't it? It'd be such a great idea. Yeah. Even I can't, like, a, yeah, Fuji could totally do something like that. They, 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 you, you set when you want to start your trip and, and they have their, um film emulation you know that you can select from so you know you, you, it's literally like loading up a, a roll of fuji film or something but it's yeah. it's digital and you can pick you know i want a superior in there and you load it up and then you get 36 pictures you know and then yeah, yeah. Uh, over the course of whatever amount of time and yeah that'd be pretty cool Fuji do this we're taking credit by the way <laughs> yeah. well i think it's uh some photography blog should probably i can't remember who it was that i read it on they should probably take credit for it but yeah well uh, it's crazy uh what you mentioned a couple of minutes ago about uh you know how that photographer doesn't look at his work until a year afterwards and and how we were talking about how we can go back and look through work that we you know did very we can easily look through our previous work because we have computers and we have them on hard drives and stuff and we can just load up the digital file even for our film but you know film photographs we have scans and stuff and we can just easily access them on the computer it's really interesting to think about 
some of the OG photographers who their work was stored, you know, on the negatives themselves. And when they didn't go ahead and print the actual images, you know, that the, there's negatives that they probably had that they just never looked at again. And who knows what, what they you know would have would have found on those negatives that they would have been blown away by, you know, 10 years, 15 years after they'd originally taken the photo. I think we have it very, you know, we're very fortunate to be able to just access our, our pictures so easily on the computer. Um, but, you know, I look in my closet right here where I have the thousands and thousands of negatives that I've shot and Im imagining having to go through and look through each negative and, and try to find ones that, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, maybe missed the first go around or when I first took them um, and, you know, having to print it out and, and to be, to fully be able to appreciate it in, in all its glory. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, kind of gives you some perspective and a little bit more respect for some of the older photographers that were out there, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. And working yeah, I mean, before the digital age. A lot like your dad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My dad, well, I joke about it cause my dad was like super into a, uh, he, he was teaching photography right when digital exploded. So he like the school he was at, he converted the whole dark room, everything to just got rid of it and just, just said, we're going digital. <laughs> so I give him, I give him a bunch of shit for it because he's, I'm like, dad, you just, you, you, you sway in everyone away from film. And you know, he was like, you know, he, now, now he laughs about it, but it, you know, he's like, well, it's funny. Cause that's the way everyone thought it was going to go. Like, Oh my God. Like, I don't need to put a role in. I'm I got unlimited pictures on here, or not unlimited, but you know I can. I generally went to a party last uh, last week. Yeah. I pulled out my little Olympus RC or whatever it's like, like a trip basically. Right, right, yeah. And one of my friends was there, and he's thirty nine now, thirty eight something. Yeah. Uh, generally, had never never seen a film camera. He just yeah. Did Wow! Like, how, how is that taking a photo? And I pulled out a canister of another roll of film that I had. Yeah. This is this is film. You load it into the camera. And he's like, Nah, you're not taking a photo. Especially as the camera's really quiet. So yeah. like, that's, you, you just press the button. Like there's no sound on it. I was like, This is amazing, isn't it? It is. My first year of photography, I was in the dark room, loving life. It was amazing. Second year, no more dark room. You know, yeah. there's now a a Mac suite, and I was like, "Well, the first year, I was in the dark room, and I used a PC. Now you're telling me my second year, you've got you're going to teach me how to use a Mac, which I've never yeah. used. Yeah, only digital. So I don't know. <laughs> I, I dropped out, but <laughs> different than that. It's it. Do your own passion. Crazy. Yeah. I did. I think I did the same. Like I, well, I didn't do the same, but it was similar. I bought a camera. I learned to shoot on film. Ben was like, oh, if I had a digital camera as well, I could learn a lot quicker. Ben thought I should really go and study it. Went to college, yeah, did a year and just went, I hate it. I don't mm -hmm. want to see it behind a computer. Maybe going out to take photos, let's, let's say like 20% of the time and the rest of the time mm -hmm. just editing stuff in Photoshop. Yeah. Uh, if that's not what I'm here for, yeah uh, yeah and then didn't take another i think for a couple of years i was like don't like taking photos anymore and just didn't, yeah. didn't really do anything but like again like similarly i look back at the first photos i took with that film camera and i'm like i just well what did i have to take pictures of just go out into the street and take photos and there's some like really bold uh, photos of just like kind of being not intrusive but being like the sort of pictures that if I took them now I would really have to think hard about like okay I'm going to go and I'm going to stand in this group of people and I'm going to take some shots and it's going to be kind of candid street photography whereas at the mm -hmm. time like I've got a camera I'm just going to take pictures of things and like didn't really um, worry about all that kind of thing and it's yeah. like, they're really nice to look back on. And yeah. I never used to get stuff scanned. I just had my negatives, got some prints, uh -huh. boxes and boxes of stuff that yeah. being on a computer screen, which is quite 
nice, really. But yeah. Um, what's his name? There's a guy called Hamish. Uh, I can't remember his last name, but he runs a photography blog called 35 MMC, and he throws all his negatives away. Like, just get some scandi and bins them. <laughs> oh, that makes me <laughs> shrivel up, and <laughs> that scares me. Yeah. <laughs> wow. It's quite, uh, people in their approaches, man. I mean, whatever yeah. works. Yeah, I think it's just like yeah. I don't, I don't want them. I just want to see the pictures. Wow. All right. All right. <laughs> Something else. Right. Do you think you'll ever make another video using Super 8? Yeah. Uh, got a, a role coming back right now, actually. Oh, sick. Yeah. yeah. I'll watch one of your older videos of the Super yeah. using I, or the beach, some, right. some beach somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Canton Beach. Yeah. That's the one. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool look amazing we, again we live yeah <laughs> no water around, so. yeah um yeah i'd be dude i'd be shoot, shooting super eight like every video if i could afford it <laughs> yeah i i love super eight and i lucked out finding a 50 dollar super eight camera canon uh auto zoom 814 it's like the stand like the classic like when you think of super eight like the silver pistol grip canon super 8 camera i found one on craigslist for 50 bucks um and some guy was like yeah it's been sitting in my closet for like 30 years i don't i mean it, the motor still runs but i don't i can't confirm that it works ran out drove out an hour and a half bought it and uh, put a roll through it and the thing just worked perfectly it's in mint condition and uh yeah uh, i the first time i got super 8 scans back i was just addicted immediately it's such a and it's crazy too how how easy and wonderful it is to color correct like color correcting uh like a pro res 4444 file yeah on a super 8 scan is oh it's a dream it's so nice and and the the character is just beautiful and then so naturally I'm like, Oh God, now I got to st- start shooting super 16. Yeah. So, but, but I've, I've been able to tame that beast a little bit because I'm really not trying to, to uh, make my bank account, bank account cry any more than it already does. But um, yeah, no, I like, hopefully I can, I want to shoot like a whole video on motion picture film at some point. Yeah. That'd be insane. Like a whole, like six, like do a whole, hike or something or field trip video to and, and shoot it all in 16 millimeters so have somebody come out and shoot on 16 millimeter but i'll have to save up a massive uh bankroll to <laughs> make that happen you'll have to come with you there's no way yeah oh yeah no down, quickly run yeah. And walk and yeah wait waste half the roll on the walking back and forth so yeah, yeah. um uh, but... you that role that you're getting developed now or, or in the process of doing mm-hmm. are you gonna put that out yeah um yeah it's it's pretty it, it'll, it'll just be like a really short thing but i have some pictures that go along with the video so it'll be like a kind of but it's it's not like a sitting talking it'll just be kind of like a, a montage of like some super eight the super eight footage and then the uh the pictures that i took while we were filming and stuff but it's a pretty fun video and um first super eight role i've gotten developed in almost a year so yeah, I'm really excited to get that back. And yeah. you've been selling a lot of gear recently. You sold a couple uh-huh. of lenses and stuff. Is is that for something? Um, just like I don't know. The last couple of months of just like life has just been happening. You know, um, haven't been able to focus a lot on photography. Got COVID. Started a new job. Got knee surgery. Moving into a new place with some buddies. Um, and I also am just trying to condense my possessions. I, I don't like having a lot of things. Um, I like, I just like having essentials. Um, and I think I've kind of figured out my, like what cameras are important to me. Like I'm not somebody that's ever going to collect a bunch of film cameras. I don't think. If you want a camera that bad, you'd just buy it again. Or, you know, just- yeah, yeah, exactly. So there, like I, it's, it's hard, especially when like more, I don't know, like if, if it's just like a $50 little, camera or something and it's just sitting on my shelf that you know that's whatever but when i have like a pentax six seven sitting on my shelf that i'm i'm just like i it's 
don't use it a ton anymore. I've been loving the Bronica SQ. It's like, I, I get why people want to keep, you know, their, their film cameras forever. But for me, it's like, I don't know. Um, uh, like I'd, I'd rather just have, have the cash, especially at the stage in life that I'm in right now, where I'm kind of going through these transitions and stuff. So yeah, it's just, you know, um, it's really just to, to condense my possessions and belongings, um, as I'm about to move and then, um, yeah, put some extra cash in the pocket so that I can put that towards making, you know, videos and buying film and stuff. Um, but I do have, uh, a couple new cameras on the way that you'll see soon. That is, uh, not much to say about it. It's going to be a devastating blow to the bank account. So yeah, I was, I was selling some stuff maybe to compensate a little bit for what's about to happen. But, um, but yeah, I think I've really figured out like which cameras are going to suit me well for the type of work that I do. And I think it's just a really a, like a cheap point shoot for 35, um, six, six, my Bronic SQ, that's going to be like my camera forever. I, we'll never sell that camera first camera ever first film camera ever owned and uh, it was a gift from my dad and then um and then i you know i'd like to have a six seven camera too um and then maybe uh maybe indulge in in the large format eventually but I, i i just can't i'm not somebody that can own like multiple cameras of the same format like I, I couldn't own two six by six cameras. I couldn't own two six by seven cameras. I just, I hate when I have like unnecessary things or, or even for the sense that if I want to go out and shoot, I don't want to be thinking like, Oh, should I bring this camera? Oh, should I bring this camera? And then when I go out and shoot and I, and I get to a point where I'm like, dang, I wish I would have brought this other camera that all just hinders the actual experience. So I like just limiting stuff. That's why like, I only have like one lens for all my cameras. I don't like having a selection of things that just distracts me when I'm out, out shooting. It's like work with what you got. And uh, yeah, there's always a beautiful image to be taken with whatever gear you're working with. So. Yeah, no, that's good. I think that's, I tried to do that recently, like live more minimalistic. In fact, Luke, I think mm-hmm. I was telling you about that documentary on Netflix. Yeah. 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 The minimalists or yep. uh, they did like one one episode and a year later did another one. Yeah. That changed that changed my opinion on everything. Like I went right. to my wardrobe and threw away <laughs> yep. three quarters of my wardrobe. Just yep. I looked at it, I was like, I don't need it. You know I know. I was about to say, I was like, I got rid of so many socks after watching that. I, <laughs> yeah. I've only got I know. Socks it's yeah you realize you just don't need a lot of the stuff that you have 